Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Adrian Sampson from Cornell. And I'm Caroline Triple from Stanford. Uh, we are extremely pleased to welcome you to the Wild and Crazy Ideas or Wacky session at ASPLOS. Uh, can you raise your hand if you've ever been to a Wacky session before? I'm so sorry. This was not under our control. Uh, to briefly, for the, for the rest of you, to briefly justify why Wacky exists. In my opinion, ASPLOS is the, is the greatest academic conference that ever existed, but it has one fatal flaw, which is when you submit a paper to ASPLOS, to the main technical track, it has to have like some tiny granule of, of uh, realisticness. That is like, it has, to, it has to be like at least somewhat reasonable. So that limits the amount of creativity that you can have at ASPLOS. So in my opinion, Wacky, the, the reason Wacky exists is to take ASPLOS from being like nearly perfect to absolutely perfect by fixing this flaw and allowing people to let their creativity run absolutely wild uh, and crazy and ideaful in the wacky session. Is that clear, everyone on board? All right. Okay, so to get things started, we're going to have a wacky keynote, also known as a wacky note. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Shore, who is a professor uh, with me at Stanford. And um, to get to know our speakers a little bit better, we're gonna mention what they had for dinner last night. So Sarah had a packet of pretzels on her flight um, and uh, she is going to talk to you about some of her super cool work on programming languages for emerging hardware. Thank you for the kind introduction. All right, uh, first logistically, I guess this is the clicker, huh? All right, so today I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about how we can do computation without what we consider computers, right? So let's think a little bit about computing today. Uh, normally when we think about a computer, we usually think about some sort of silicon chip, right, that implements digital logic. Uh, this computer might have some collection of digital computational units, such as CPUs, FPUs, et cetera, et cetera, and it will maintain program state with memories, caches, and registers, right? Now, typically, a human developer, what a human developer will do is they'll write a program in some sort of high-level language, and then a compiler will translate this program from a human-readable program to a machine-interpretable one, right? Where this machine-interpretable program is typically a sequence of machine instructions uh, that the digital computer can execute. Right? So, okay, well, what if we adopt a different computing paradigm? How about instead of mapping a program to a sequence of instructions, which is executed by digital hardware, let's map a program to an analog substrate and use the physics of the sub of substrate to compute the program results. Uh, this is analog computing, right? So, okay, really quick, how does analog computing work? Uh, well, the best way to explain this sort of thing is by example. So let's consider the following computation. Let's say we have a material over here and we wanna run the following experiment. We want to introduce heat into one end of this one-dimensional material. Uh, and then we want to figure out the amount of heat at the midpoint uh, of the material after the system has settled, right? Or when, I'm saying, when I say the system has settled, what I mean is that uh, the, the heat exchange has kind of stopped and it's reached this kind of plateau, right? Uh, so to accomplish these objectives, to be able to do this experiment, we need to be able to simulate the propagation of heat through the material over time. Right, and to do this, we need to be able to model the, uh, ev the, the evolution of the heat at each point in the material. Right, and so one way you can do this is you can basically cut up your material into a bunch of different points, and then you independently model the movement of heat um, at each point. Right, so what's going to happen is you're going to have a bunch of differential equations here um, to implement this, where each differential equation is going to model the, how the heat changes in the material over time at a particular point in the material. Right, and so we have these points, P0 through Pn, where dpi dt captures the, 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 the derivative of the heat over time uh, at, the, at, that, at the point pi. Now, of course, it also works with an initial state. And so we're going to start with a cold material. So the initial heat at each point of this material is going to be zero. Uh, OK, so now we can introduce heat into the system, right? Uh, so we're going to introduce heat into the system by adding this external function, forcing function gt, right? And so what's going to happen is we can, this gt function is an external function that's a function of time and we can use it to introduce heat into the system, right? And so you might imagine GT might look something like this, right? Where you have this sort of pulse you provide at the beginning that's going to model introducing the heat on the leftmost point of the material. Okay, that, now with that out of the way, now with the application out of the way, let's talk about how we map this computation onto an analog substrate. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, it actually depends on the analog substrate, right? And so for illustration purposes, to start from a place of uh, relative reasonableness, we're gonna target an analog substrate that I worked with before. 
Uh, enter the electrical analog computer, right? This is a silicon CMOS computer. Uh, the details are not that important. All, important. all you need to know is that it's going to leverage the analog behavior of transistors uh, and other analog devices present in the silicon to solve differential equations. And the way it's going to represent values in this, uh, in this piece of silicon is going to represent values as time varying analog currents, right? Um, this device is configurable post fabrication. And so you can basically write configurations to it to implement a variety of different analog circuits that perform computation over analog currents, right? And so that's basically how you configure the physics of the hardware, right? Now this, this, piece, this piece of hardware also has an, input, has an input and output interface, has some IO. It takes analog current trajectories as input and it produces analog current trajectories as output, right? Now to execute your computation, what you're going to do is you're going to configure your circuit to implement the physics of the desired computation. And then you're going to power on the hardware. At the same time, you have to start, you start providing all of the external input signals into the analog computer, right? And what's going to happen is the computer is going to process these analog signals and start to simultaneously produce the analog currents as output, right? OK, so how do we perform our heat transfer experiment with this analog computer? Well, the first step here is we need to configure the analog substrate to emulate the heat transfer problem. Right, so basically um, you're, what's going to happen is you're going to try to derive a configuration for the analog hardware where the dynamics of the analog current CI in the substrate are going to be analogous to the dynamics of the points PI in the material. Right, and if we do this correctly, if all goes well, we should be able to measure an analog current CI in the substrate and that will tell us the heat at the point PI in the material. Right, this is what I mean by analog computation. Uh, now, of course, you know, we have started with an initial, initial heat. This, is, this externally provide, provided heat is, is provided to the analog computer as an analog current. Okay, now we don't need to, you may ask, well, do we need to manually come up with a circuit? Well, the answer is uh, we don't. You can, use some, you can use a compiler to automate the mapping process. Um, this was the kind of the focus of a lot of my prior work, right? And so what the, what the compiler will do basically is it'll take your dynamical system, it'll take your differential equations, and it maps it to the analog substrate. And so it's going to automatically identify an analog circuit that implements the desired dynamical system computation. Uh, and it's going to automatically identify the relationships between the analog current trajectories in the, in the circuit and the uh, heat trajectories in your starting system. Right? And so this mapping is very important because we can use this mapping to figure out how to post process the analog outputs to get our computational result and how to synthesize analog inputs. Uh, that provide the inputs that we want to that we want to use in our computation. Okay, so you know the compiler automates this mapping process. Something important to keep in mind with this compiler, with, with compilation to this sort of hardware, is that you're going to want to leverage the analog behavior you're using to do computation, and you're going to want to attenuate away all of the unwanted analog behavior um, that you're not using in your computation, right? So, for example, if analog noise is not a feature in your computation, you'd want to attenuate it away. OK, so at this point, we have configured an analog substrate that models the movement of heat in the material, and we can now use it to solve our high-level problem, right? So we're basically going to construct a routine that takes in the initial heat we want to provide and generates an analog current right, um, to provide into the analog computer. And you can kind of think of this as a conversion function that's going to take us from our problem domo domain to the, to the computational domain of the analog substrate, which is analog currents. Now, once we, once, we want, once we have some, some uh, signal trajectories, output signal trajectories, we want to be able to post-process them to get the, end -to -end the final result, right? So we're going to introduce an output conversion procedure that's going to take the analog signals from the electrical analog domain um, to our problem domain. So this, is, for example, is going to study the signal over time and identify uh, when it's stable and then take a measurement, right? And basically, it'll, it'll, the, the end result here would be the heat at the midpoint of the circuit at steady state. And so what is the program in this, for this kind of computational model? Well, the program here is the hardware configuration you write to the analog substrate to get the physics that you want, and then the uh, input conversion and output conversion functions that take us from the problem domain to the analog domain, and from the analog domain to the problem domain. And these are the input-output interfaces of our program, right? Uh, so basically, so OK, yeah, these are the input-output interfaces. And then the internals of the program is basically an analog computation that is directly performed with an analog substrate um, using the physical behavior that is native to that analog substrate. OK, and so we're going to skip over this. OK, so question here, uh, could we have used a different analog substrate? Sure we could have. Uh, let's think of another one. How about a stick? Yeah? 
Uh, why, why worry about transistors when we can use a stick? OK, so let's explore this idea, um, this stick-based analog computing idea. It's not a joke. <laughs> it, it, well, we'll see. Uh, OK, so first thing we need to do is we need to configure our analog substrate, in this case a stick, uh, to emulate the 1D heat transfer problem. Right? So here's our stick-based analog computer. Here's our heat transfer problem. Uh, our first step is going to be to find a stick with thermal transfer properties that are analogous to our target heat transfer computation. Right? So we have a whole bunch of sticks. We identify that this stick um, has characteristics that are most similar to the, uh, you know, the, the, the computation we want to implement. And then we next are going to map our heat transfer problem to the stick analog domain, right? Uh, the first step of this is identifying the correspondence between points PI in our material and uh, positions on the stick, right? And so we're gonna have a material position to stick position mapping. And we can further configure our stick by breaking it, right? Like maybe we're only using a subset of the stick's length, we would break off the length that's going unused um, to ensure that the heat doesn't continue moving through the part of the stick we're not using. Um, the next thing we need to do once we've figured out the positions is we need to map heat in our, from our problem domain to, heat, to the heat moving through the stick, right? So we need to identify the correspondence between the heat at point PI in the material and the heat at the corresponding position in the stick. Uh, and now, of course, there's a problem here. I mean, there's a few problems here, but this is one problem. <laughs> The stick-based analog computer may have analog behaviors that are not captured in our model, right? For example, uh, the stick exists in the environment and the stick might lose heat, which is not captured in our model. So you might need to further configure the stick-based analog computer to attenuate unwanted analog behavior. For example, if we don't want to lose heat, we might want to consider insulating the stick. Or, uh, you know, we could also, we might not mitigate the behavior at all. Uh, and that's because, you know, we're, and we're modeling thermal transfer we have the simplified model that doesn't account for heat loss. Well, the stick is implementing heat loss. It's a more accurate model of our computation. So, you know, great. Now we have a more accurate model. Uh, we don't have to fix anything. Okay, so what does a compiler look like for this computational substrate? Uh, well, basically, um, the compiler is going to fabricate the best stick implementation for our problem. And so you could imagine, for example, using something like, uh, like one of these, uh, like a 3D printer, that is able to fabricate like uh, multiple materials, right? To create a stick that has the thermal transfer characteristics and attenuates the behaviors that we don't want. Okay, so now we have our configured stick. Uh, what does our end-to-end -end computation look like now? What we're gonna do is we're going to take our initial heat like we did before. We're going to apply the appropriate heat to the stick by using our uh, stick conversion factor. And then we're going to measure the heat at the appropriate point of the stick, right? And once, that, once the heat reaches steady state, then we have, we have measured, we have identified the steady state heat measurement at that midpoint. Now, this unfortunately is not really, there aren't really any good advantages to a stick-based computing. Uh, it has poor runtime. The movement of heat takes time. And honestly, we're probably not gonna be able to beat a digital computer uh, with that. And the other reason is it's power inefficient. Uh, like, you know, applying heat to a stick is extremely power intensive when you compare it to something like uh, running a microcontroller, for example. Okay, so I mean, is this the end of stick-based computing? Well, I mean, it might be, but you know, we can consider other kinds of computing, right? Really, it turns out any physical process with interesting dynamics can be an analog computer, right? So while we're used to thinking of analog computation with circuit elements like this, you know, any physical process with interesting dynamics can be an analog computing substrate. And by the way, there have been papers written, I think about all, all of these physical substrates. Okay, and so you might be asking me, okay, well, surely people don't actually perform computation like this. Uh, well, actually, uh, enter ge the field of geology. It turns out uh, ge researchers and ge the geological scientists are off sciences are often interested in studying how the flow of magma in influences the formation of geological structures. Now, if you do this computationally, you need to run a pretty complicated fluid simulation, which is computational in computationally intensive and also difficult to implement accurately because not only do you have to discretize time, you have to discretize space, the space of the material. Right, so it turns out what researchers do is they'll solve these problems by emulating the flow of magma through rock with physical substances. They'll use honey to emulate the behavior of magma in the physical process, and then they'll use sand or a certain type of like a mineral powder to model the geological structure before magma is introduced. And so that's a computational substrate. We have this analog sand-based analog substrate, which we can use to do computation. So what are its input and output interfaces? Well, the input interface is an injection tube of honey that, is inject, that injects honey into the prescribed locations in the substrate. Uh, the output interface is the structure of the honey and sand mixture over time. What is the programming interface? Well, first, uh, you can choose the honey and sand that you use. 
Uh, and this actually is important because different materials will capture different behaviors in the magma and rock under different conditions. And so this is an actual table from one of the papers where they actually went ahead and described this, the physical properties of a various candidate honeys and glucose syrups you can work with. Uh, the other thing you can configure is the geometric arrangement of sand in the enclosure, right? So here's a bunch of different uh, candidate topologies that you can use uh, for this sort of simulation. So what is the mapping problem, right? Uh, well, it's composed of a few different components. You first have to identify the mapping between the geometry of the, in, the, in the honey sand analog domain and the original model, right? And by the way, again, paper, table from a paper. Uh, so you can see that they come up with, they come up with a mapping, right? That takes them from their model, from, from the, like it, it takes them from their experimental model to the model that they're actually trying to simulate. You also need to identify the mapping between model time and experimental time. So this will tell you how much time you need to wait in real life uh, to have your simulation run. And then the last thing you need to identify is the mapping between the uh, external magma input you're supplying into the system and then the external honey input, right? That you're actually applying into the experiment, you're, you're providing into the experiment. And the kind of neat thing here is without changing the actual materials you're working with, you can kind of mess around with how you scale your, the size of your enclosure and how you kind of position things to get a variety of different um, like magma flow problems, implement a variety of different magma flow problems using the same physical substrate. So you can potentially select one honey and one sand instance, and you can uh, change how you define your problem in, so in software uh, to run the computation you're interested in. So what is a compiler for this? Uh, well, you know, a compiler would do things like identify the best honey sand selection and the best parameter mapping for a given magma flow problem. And the end-to-end -end computation here would basically be, uh, you know, given an injected magma flow, we're going to identify, we're going to translate that into an injection of honey into the substrate. Uh, and then we're going to let the analog computer do its thing, and then we'll record a video feed of how of the of the, of the evolution of the physical state of the of the honey uh, sand substrate. And then you do some sort of um, image analysis to figure out like uh, what is happening geologically. And you know, researchers have, have actually been able to replicate a, a variety of geological structures with this approach. Okay, so neat, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, sand, but you know, they say based computation is probably not going to replace conventional computation. Uh, so you might ask me why study these least, less reasonable forms of analog computation, right? Well, you know, there's a few reasons. Uh, first off, it's an interesting approach to computing that pushes the limits of what we consider a computer. And then second, there's a lot of interesting programmable and 3D printable materials um, that are potentially attractive for doing analog computation uh, that have this sort of feature where they're continuous in space and continuous in time. And so I guess the, the, the thought I have here is that by maybe studying how people use these sorts of physical substrates to do computation in other domains, we might get an idea of what the programming interfaces and configuration interfaces for this hardware should look like. Uh, yeah, so we basically will need a way to map functionality to these substrates. And so we might be able to draw inspiration from how people do this uh, with natural substrates uh, to inform our approaches. And so, you know, I mean, we should broaden our notion of computation because it might enable us to develop more software-based approaches for these systems. I'll not take questions. Sorry? You can take your own questions. Oh, okay, sure. Yes. Uh, hi, Tom Wenish from the University of Michigan and Google. Uh, I'm curious how many more flavors of flavors of honey are we going to have to introduce before we get Turing complete honey-based computation? <laughs> Uh, this is a this is an ex excellent question. I mean, uh, there's already there's actually several papers on like re the rheological properties of honey. Um, and I mean, like, if, I mean, here's the thing, right? If you can model, if you can if you can translate your program into a PDE, then it's already turned. Then you know this is already a Turing complete form of computation, right? Um, did you answer your question? Yes. So, uh, like Curtis Stony Brook University, do you describe that? Uh, an analog, an ASAC, right? An <laughs> application specific analog computer. Yeah. What do you think about like a, an SPAC? Like okay. A one? Yeah, I wish I, could, I wish I could get to this. So, I mean, here's the thing, right? Digital reconfigurability or reprogrammability is an asset if it's expensive to manufacture these, manufacture the physical substrate. In this case, sand and honey are pretty cheap. Well, honey is not that cheap, but you know, sand is pretty cheap. And so, if you can automate the process of constructing a topology, uh, then, you know, digitally reprogrammable, reprogramming a reconfigurable substrate and fabricating a new instance are kind of this, you know, fairly similar in my eyes, at least. 
Did you answer your question? Sure, but it seems, it seems expensive. Uh, it's, I mean, it's not free, right? But then you have to ask yourself, what is the cost of having a reconfigurable honey sand substrate, right? How is that going to limit your computation or, change, or influence your ability to do accurate computation, right? So there's a trade-off there as well. But I mean, if, we can, if you can get reprogrammability for free, I mean, I'm all, I'm all for it, you know? And I, one more thing, I guess there are some materials that are continuous that are reconfigurable, and you can write voltages and change the physical behavior at a particular point in the substrate. So that, that could be a reality if those materials work out. Uh, uh, I think a comment to, uh, to the progress of st stick-based computation. Uh, we, we all know that like uh, the heat transmission is passive, so the signal cannot be amplified. It's similar to a circuit that have only transi uh, resistors yeah. without any transistors, so signal will not be amplified. So I think for stick-based stick computation, you must have some way to amplify the signal. So uh, the only way to do that is like let the stick to catch on, catch on fire. <laughs> I like this so idea. That, that's the necessary part to allow us to do logic computation. Yeah, we need a heat repeater, right? Yeah, for, yeah, for yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, or we can use a very short stick, right? And just map your computation to a relatively small part, small region, right? Okay. Uh, I'm yeah. So I'm from University of California, Santa Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good question. A comment. Yes, back there. Uh, okay, hello. I'm Xu Haoluo from University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. So, uh, my question is that uh, what's uh, the accuracy guarantee of such a analog computer? So, for example, you, if we want to solve a differential equation, if we want to solve it using some uh, numerical method like using MATLAB. Uh, the results we get uh, based on those numeric methods, the error should be bounded. But uh, for using a like analog computer like a stick, there will be like many noises within the process. And uh, I assume that uh, there will be like digital to analog converter and uh, convert from analog to digital, digital. So in those processes, there will also be many, many errors and noises. So uh, I wonder how do you uh, define the accuracy or what kind of accuracy are you expecting from such kind of a analog computer? Thank you. That's a good question. Uh, so accuracy is kind of subjective in this case. Typically we're modeling a uh, physical process and that model itself is inaccurate, right? Uh, so, I mean, if you're, if you're asking about accuracy with respect to the model, uh, then you might, well, I mean, here's the thing too, right? Like uh, with, with uh, digital simulation, you need to discretize. You need to discretize your space, right? Discretize time, discretize state, and that also introduces error, even if the numerical computation is very accurate. With analog computation, you do both of these. Com you do computation in continuous time and continuous space, so you you eliminate that source of inaccuracy. You might have other sources of inaccuracy, um, but as long as these are not the, these don't have a dominant effect on the computation, uh, then you will get fairly reasonable reasonable results. Uh, so I guess the answer is, I mean, the, the, the TLDR is, uh, what does it actually mean to be accurate when you're modeling something, when your model is inaccurate? And the other thing is, uh, you know, uh, with digital computation, you incur inaccuracies simply by doing the computation with an algorithm, whereas you don't have that source of inaccuracy in analog. Um, so anyway, my thoughts. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. it oh, sorry. <laughs> but you can take it, you can find me after. I get the, there's a cheese thing, is that? Can you use cheese for computation? I'm sure you can. There probably is a paper on it, right? Like some sort of deformation property of cheese thing, you know? Thanks again, Sarah. That was yeah. <laughs> Sarah, is this your phone? Oh, it is. I look forward to doing some computing with cheese myself in a few minutes here. But first, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Kevin Lachlan, who is a PhD student at the University of Michigan. And an important thing about uh, Kevin is that he has gone totally Swiss native. And for dinner last night, he had a block of Gruyere and a chunk of bread. Uh, thank you, Adrian.
cool. Hello, wacky audience. I am Kevin Robert Lachlan, and the topic of today's rhyme is a hardware software problem. It stems from the fact that memory controllers are basically black boxes we have scarce control over. And thus, in this talk, to you, we propose software-defined memory controllers to end various woes. What woes, you ask? Well, sit back and listen, as we henceforth describe the current position. Cloud vendors want control of their memory to tune trade-offs among performance, security, cost, and energy. But today's DRAM controllers leave little in the way of allowing cloud vendors to have their own say. In this vein of thinking, controller settings come to mind since they're coarse-grained, monolithic, and statically defined. As for coarse granularity, settings come with few options, limiting cloud vendors from deploying innovative concoctions. Think of write scheduling, refresh rates, DDR timings. Do you see what I'm doing here? My whole talk is rhyming. <laughs> the row policy is one example we expose. It determines after reads and writes if rows are opened or closed. Left open leaves the row buffered for future access flows yielding better performance if we'll soon use the same row. But closing the rows better if we'll access a different one, since the necessary pre-charge will already be done. Unfortunately, today's settings offer limited adaptivity, failing to account for per workload sensitivity. For example, some workloads benefit from hits in the buffer, meaning a mostly closed policy can cause these workloads to suffer. Thus, we propose system software should define the policy that is best for its apps at the time. By allowing such flexibility, latency can be reduced on a per workload basis, a noticeable boost. The workloads that most benefit from being uninhibited are those for which row buffer locality is exhibited. As for monolithic, we consider DRAM addressing where a single fixed Fizz to DDR mapping ain't a blessing. You see, today's server addressing is generally designed for bank-level parallelism, leaving other things behind. Bank-level parallelism allows requests to be served at the same time as others, usually good for perf. However, today's parallelism is generally achieved by forcing cache lines to be widely interleaved across all banks of DRAM such that a single VM has little isolation among other drawbacks as well. On the lack of isolation front, interleaving, we must mention, creates timing side channels through per bake contention. Software defined mappings could therefore allow per context isolation for those that need it now. Another drawback of this widespread interleaving is a drop in row buffer hits such that latency increases. Recall that a row can be open or closed, where opened is faster if we hit in the row. In order to make a row hit a reality, our chances improve if we exploit memory locality. Mapping fizz adders to the same DDR row gives us a shot at a hit being a go. But widespread interleaving maps these addresses instead to different banks such that buffer hits are dead. Conversely, by allowing per-context mappings, we can keep this buffer hit dilution from happening and win back performance on a per-workload basis, along with VM isolation that's so much more gracious. As for statically defined, consider metadata per line, opt used for ECTC, but perhaps else in other designs. Prior work shows certain data might not need ECC, or might benefit more from fulfilling other needs. Consider, for instance, fault-tolerant workloads, where ECC might be something we can forego. Here, software could define the use of these bits to store useful data or tracking of it. These extra bits could help to define access count, security domains, and whatever else comes to mind. Furthermore, we note that in DDR5, we'll have two times more metadata allocated per line. And thus, we point out innovation can be achieved without sacrificing usages already conceived. 
In sum, to hear more about the controllers we've discussed, you can read about them in our two-pager thrust. And with that, wacky audience, thanks for listening to me. And since we're here in Lausanne, à vous un grand merci. Hello Garza, Texas A&M. How long did the rhymes take? <laughs> so I'm in my fourth year of my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I started in high school. Um, yeah. Um, what are the sort of programmable knobs that you envision? I know you like talked about a bit here, but sort of, I guess, on the more practical side of things, uh, do you envision having like some like fallback path for things you didn't think of initially as far as like knobs? To what degree do you envision programmable memory controllers? So I think that the single biggest um, primitive that would be useful um, is, is uh, finer grain control over uh, the addressing mechanism. And in fact, there was a talk this morning on software defined uh, physical addressing in 3D memory. Um, so you should check out that paper because it's a cool paper. Um, uh, but I think that when you have this, uh, the, the primitive over the addressing, it opens up a lot of doors for different knobs that you can define in memory because you can customize and you can reason about, I'm going to have this individual rank that operates under these DDR timing parameters, this individual rank that operates with these, um, uh, with this row buffer policy um, and, and different parameters in that sense. So, uh, Kostin Raichur from the Politechnika Bucharest. I, I, I have to say that you have invented a new way of presenting. <laughs> that is a bit disconcerting. <laughs> uh, you, you managed to present some really tough material, except that nobody understood what you're actually saying because of your rhyming it was so good. So I think this could be, you know, the new uh, sort of covert channel of conference presentations or when you're like ashamed of the work and you don't know what to do you just do a rhyme so because i really did not follow whatever you're saying i was just waiting for the rhyme so good stuff thank you so what do you see as the challenge today with variability in row buffer retention delay <laughs> Excellent. I, I enjoyed the rhyme. Um, uh, so the so the challenge with uh, variability in row buffer delay is twofold. So first, there's just the question of do we like? We, obviously, we always want to be improving the latency of our workloads, and I think that generally, when we have like a big server machine, we have many, many, many banks of DRAM and many different workloads that become intermixed, and they end up kind of killing row buffer locality for certain workloads because there's so much interference amongst each other. And so I think that the biggest challenge there is that you tend to have some workloads that just naturally they're not going to have great row buffer locality. And you have some workloads that are going to have very good row buffer locality and intermixing them across all these different banks uh, kind of puts all of those on the level of not having good row buffer locality. And so I think we would benefit from isolating certain workloads to a certain set of banks and uh, leaving other workloads kind of uh, as interleaved as possible, so to speak. All right, thank you, Kevin. So now we have uh, Michael Reutsch from, he is a research group leader at the Barkhausen Institute. And last night for dinner, he had the uh, reception hors d'oeuvres. Have to lose weight somehow. Thank you. So after software-defined 
No, wait. Software-defined memory controllers are fine, but compared to software-defined CPUs, they are benign. <laughs> but to be honest, I'm not going to rhyme. Um, so let, let's talk about CPUs. Um, so this is about software-defined CPUs. Um, and to be more specific, it's about all the CPU modes. So we started simple. This is what we all know, what we all love, user and kernel mode. But over the years, we started piling up modes and modes and modes, right? And so we have all this complexity now in our CPUs, whether we use it or not. And that's not a good situation. Think, for example, of uh, one of the more complex modes of SGX. It's been widely speculated that this mode is largely implemented in microcode. But as the systems people that we are here now, we kind of think, well, this is given to us by the CPU vendor and we have to live with what we get. This is not exactly a perfect situation. So in this talk, I want to ask the question, uh, what if we could influence these modes? What if we could change them? What if we could program them? So to ultimately, what if CPU modes were programmable, what would happen is we could essentially take all of this away and replace it with software. Okay, so programmable CPUs, um, you could now ask what, what, what is this guy talking about? CPUs are already programmable, right? We do it all the time. We have an instruction stream. We feed it into our CPU. Uh, we have uh, these, all these nice functional units. They are uh, orthogonal nicely. Our compiler stitched this together and uh, we get program execution out of it. Um, but this is only like one half of the story, right? This is, I would now coin the term here to call this the CPU data plane. Uh, but there is this whole other world on the other side, uh, which is the CPU control plane. Uh, we enter it differently. Uh, we enter it with traps and exceptions. And what is in there is much less nicer than what we have on the left side, right? This is fixed, complex logic that is hardwired into the CPU uh, and it's, it's not, the modes are not orthogonal. We cannot like compose them nicely uh, and they are dictated to us by what the CPU vendor gives us. So, and this is exactly this right side here is, is what we want to replace uh, when we talk about software defined CPUs or when I talk about software defined CPUs. So what, what should we replace it with uh, would be the question. Uh, of course, we also want some nice primitives there that we can now then compose, that we can put together as we like, not as the CPU vendors dictate. So, um, okay. Uh, but you might now also ask, how do we program it? Um, of course, we need code to do that. If it's software programmable, then there must be some code doing that. So I call this the mode switch code. Uh, and at this point, uh, you might now think, well, if there's new code, that implements these modes. How does this code run? In what mode does this switching code run? Well, of course, in the mode switch mode. <laughs> kind of obvious, isn't it? So, okay, I wanted to, I started claiming that we want to remove all the modes and now we added a new one. What's the deal here? Well, of course, this is the last mode we'll ever need, right? It's the mode switch mode. Um, so how do we how do we start and are you following so how do we start programming this um we want to replace the modes with a new mode and then do it all in software okay um it's complicated but let's go step by step uh let's first think about the primitives that we actually need uh so what what would we need to program in order to implement a mode switch and I just came up with four things that are probably going to be more, but let's, let's just get started figuring this out. So one thing that we, we would need is to configure what kind of data plane instructions would trap and maybe some conditions on when they would trap, like division by zero should trap or something like that. Uh, then secondly, we want to configure how the MMU interprets page permission bits. So we have a format for page table entries. But of course, we want to get rid of this fixed meaning of this is the access bit and this is the dirty bit. Uh, but this is, these are just bits and we program some logic that tells whether it traps or not. Um, then thirdly, uh, 
probably we're going to need state when we want to implement the modes in software. So there should be some memory. Uh, but let's not get into all the difficulties of using regular DRAM. Let's just put a bit of small scratch pad into the CPU where we can store state. Uh, and then lastly, we're probably going to need a bunch of special features like uh, for Intel SGX, we probably would need access to uh, uh, to set up encryption keys for memory and for doing remote attestation and things like that. So we're going to need um, some kind of additional features here. So I, probably this list is not complete if we're going to look at all the modes that are existing right now. But at least it's a starting point. So we can we can think of these individual primitives and now try and stitch them together in this special code that runs in this mode switch mode. What would this be good for, you might ask now? So what could we do? I mean, we have the existing modes, aren't they just fine? Well, the boring thing, of course, would be uh, we can compatibly implement the existing modes. Um, so that's an obvious thing. Uh, the, also, a little bit cooler, we can implement a different mode order, like having virtualization within user mode. Uh, cool stuff, we can invent new modes, uh, like in-process nested paging. Uh, to do tracking of memory accesses in a process. We can do in-process sandboxing by changing page permissions within processes. Uh, we can even have programming languages that check for integer overflows uh, and implement that by trapping instead of doing manual checking. Um, I have an example. Uh, go read the paper if you want to know how this should work in detail. I'm just going to jump right to the conclusion here. Uh, ask me if you want to know more details. So uh good summary here um what we can take out of this idea definitely is years of new ask plus papers so that's probably the primary motivation here uh what could we do we would we would need to build a fast cpu with these programmable modes so it's fun for the architecture people uh we can now do graphs of modes instead of the boring linear hierarchy that we have right now so it's fun for the os people uh, and of course, we can write languages that come with their own mode ideas. So it's fun for the compiler people. So overall, I think it's a great idea. We should get started. Questions. Any questions? Did I see a hand? The mic is on its way. Yeah, thanks for that, Gustav Oistrom from Uppsala University. I think we might have, you know, years of uh, wacky papers ahead of us if we move. That would be even better, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my question be. is basically just uh, if you uh, took all of these modes and, you know, maybe, you know, take, you know, uh, virtualization and user mode and so on. Uh, how would things break if we started doing this, would you say? <laughs> I mean, existing software would probably break if you do that. Um, but yeah, we can we can invent new stuff, new stuff. I guess that's the main story here. Uh, so virtualization in user mode, I think it could be useful to have something like uh, your regular VMware or whatever product not needing kernel access to do what it needs to do. Um, so I don't see why this shouldn't work. I mean, there's probably a bunch of engineering challenges once you start doing it. But anyways, new papers. <laughs> yeah, hello, uh, Tom Kuchler, ETH Zurich. Uh, my question is, how fine grain do you imagine this uh, mode? Do you think that it's basically just a bunch of ALUs connect connected by FPGA components, or is it more on a higher level that you're imagining this? I think it's more on a, so at least what I imagined is more on a higher level. Uh, I just took the existing pieces that get orchestrated when a mode switch happens today and thought of them as individual function blocks that we can put together manually. Um, but yeah, it's actually a nice idea of thinking of this as even more fine grained. But I haven't, I haven't done that thinking. So maybe you should collaborate on the next wacky paper. One last question. One last question. Um, 
Tom Wanish, uh, University of Michigan, Google. I'm curious, what do you think is the correct security architecture for a mode switch mode to prevent a compiler from showing up with a mode that gives it access to memory it's not supposed to access? Yeah, good point. Security, I haven't really thought about it that deep. So my initial thinking was just, uh, I mean, the modes are currently fixed. So my thinking was the mode switch code is loaded at boot of the CPU, and then it never changes. Of course, it would be cool if we could change at least pieces of it at runtime. Uh, but then, yeah, we have to think about like proving that the new mode code doesn't do anything nasty. So yeah, probably even verification people could be part of the new fun here. Thanks again, Michael, but we need to switch modes here. Sorry for the terrible joke. Uh, our next talk is actually a different mode, though. We need to get it from video. Uh, it's Heng Zhuo for a PhD student at the University of Wisconsin, who, as I understand it, had whatever he wanted for dinner last night because he was at home. Do we have the video? How's everybody doing in the meantime? Great. <laughs> it's, gr it's great to see everybody. I'm just really happy to be at S+. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> Thanks to all the IT people and volunteers. You're doing a great job. Almost there. It's a very artistic uh, kind of talk. Hello, everyone. My name is Hung from University of Wisconsin-Madison, and welcome to my wacky talk. Our idea is straightforward what does the title suggested, accelerator for interrupt. We think CPU needs a specialized accelerator that just for handling interrupt. Let me start with throwing a scenario on how interrupt works for um, current setup. For the simple case, we have one CPU that's running one server, server thread. From time to time, there are requests coming in sent from client through the Ethernet port, which will be causing interrupt. If that happens, CPU, CPU one switch to the kernel space to a quick response called top half, which is asynchronized, and then resume and finish the request. And the uh, bottom half software interrupt will be scheduled later on by the kernel and actually pull the packet uh, do majority of, of the work. And this style is called a new API. It's a mixture of interrupt and polling. So whenever there's interrupt coming in, the request is delayed by microsecond scale of, um, of time, uh, indicating by um, delta micro t. Now, if we scale up to two CPU and two thread, similarly, um, this is what we expect to happen. Both of the requests, when there are interrupt coming in, the request will be delayed by um, delta micro t on average. What makes it worse is when there are shared resources between server thread, which is quite often. In this case, when the server thread one needs to uh, handle the interrupt when it's grabbed in a lock, and there will be addition of microsecond scale latency added to it, but that microsecond scale latency might just uh, make server thread to hit the spin waiting limit and goes to sleep and only being waking up later. This kind of cascading effect might lead to millisecond scale of latency. There could be a one simple solution that is bringing up another CPU. For the additional CPU we brought it in, that's called CPU 3, which now will be only handling interrupt, and CPU 1 and 2 will only handling the server thread. In this case, we're separating the server workload and the interrupt, which is quite common for nowadays uh, server setup. One obvious reason is interrupts are frequent. For TCP-based transactions, one uh, single request can generate two pairs of interrupts on each side. We have a CPU2 uh, running the server thread. Before we can serve the request, CPU3 uh, need to receive the request and send out the acknowledgement. That will be one receiving and one transmission. After we finish request, there are also another pair for uh, response and acknowledgement from the client. Of course, 
there will be more pairs if the message are bigger cannot fit within one um, uh, transmission unit. <coughs> the number can be reduced by coalescing, but will lead to uh, a higher latency for fine tuning. So back to the three CPU setup I, I covered. Let's see the performance benefit. Here I'm showing the per thread performance. The x axis is the load from low to high, and the y axis is the time. With the CPU 3, that's the orange curve, you can definitely see that we have a lower latency, especially when the load is um, from medium to high, that is expected. And there's always trade off. From our point of view, in this case, because the CPU 3 is only dedicated for interrupt handling, there are wasted cycle. So for the whole system, there might be lower throughput. There could be potentials for CPU 3 to do some meaningful work. So what can we do? The solution we're proposing is introducing the accelerator that are born to handle the interrupts, do the asynchronous part of the work without the server thread being interrupted. But what kind of work are we talking about? Here, I have a function tracing in kernel stack for handling one of the specific uh, interrupt. I'm not going to try to walk through every single step of them, but kind of just showing there's a lot of them. If we can characterize them into three different steps, the first one will be the preparation uh, before the specific interrupt. The second one is the specific interrupt. And the third one is the clean up and resume. In this case, the specific one is receiving interrupt what it does is check the, um, the new API condition and then schedule the new API software interrupt, which is the bottom half. Granted, the timestamp here is not uh, entirely accurate, but give us a roughly idea on the step two. It's not only takes a small portion of the, of the, uh, of the whole time. So here, just give us another reason we can do something about it. Kernel is designing this way uh, with the idea of abstracting layers to provide compatibility. So that's why we need to work through uh, some of the generic functions. But in this specific case, because how frequently we're calling um, these functions, we don't want to do all of them. With the information we have in mind, that's bringing, the, bringing in the accelerator. And this accelerator needs to probe the PCI interrupt signals, making sure um, whenever there's an interrupt coming in, that's the interrupt we want to handle. And then we handle the specific interrupt for receiving, we check the new API conditions, schedule a new API software interrupt that the bottom half. And then of course, we're going to force to CPU if any other thing happened, not this interrupt we want to handle. If any error happening, we force to CPU. Since it's a small amount of work. We don't want to do data offloading. So we want the accelerator to be tightly coupled means uh, sitting on the, on the CPU, kind of like a functional unit targeting fine grain of work. Of course, the details will, is the major part of the project that we're going to uh, pursue in the next step. So here, just a quick summary, uh, a reiterate of goal. We want to uh, use the accelerator for interrupt handling to reduce the asynchronous time dis disturbance and reduce the tail latency. Thank you very much for listening. Hang is on the line if anybody uh, has any questions for him. Hi, Mike Ferdman, Stony Brook University. Uh, are you aware of the work by uh, Agarwal and uh, Ferdman in Cal 2019, which uh, offloaded interrupt handling to a separate core? Um, there are definitely existing wars by offloading that, so we would do aware of that. So um, our key idea is saying we don't want to offload the workload to a dedicated core. We want all the cores can handle that without in taking a penalty by introducing a small piece of accelerator.
Hey, my final question for you is, are you feeling jealous of everyone who's here physically in the, in the zone? Yeah, definitely. Because I'm only one sitting at home try, watching my own recorded video. That definitely like not the best way to do presentation. I appreciate your being game to do it at all. Thanks. <laughs> Let's uh, give him one more round of applause. Okay, this is our final uh, wacky talk. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Thalia Dimitri Dudali. Uh, she's a professor at IMDEA Software Institute, and she had the same thing as I did for dinner last night, which was chocolate. Yeah, thanks. Thank you everyone for being here, although it's, the cheese is waiting outside. So <laughs> today I'm gonna talk about how we can use images, visualization inside systems, like computer systems. So, as computer systems architecture researchers, the way we use images right now is we create graphs for our papers to evaluate them. Sometimes some of us use data monitoring tools to understand, let's say, how much CPU and memory our computer, our virtual machine is using. In my case, I had a closer relationship with visualization without even me understanding it. Uh, I did my PhD on machine learning for memory management systems. So at some point I was struggling and I was like, okay, I really need to see what these memory access patterns look like so that I can understand why my system is not working basically. So I collected some information about low level memory accesses with a profiling tool. And then I visualized those in the following way. Uh, on the Y axis, you're gonna see which memory address is being accessed. And on the X axis, you're gonna see the time where it, when it's being accessed. So I got these pretty nice pictures. And I ended up spending years staring at those pictures. <laughs> uh, but that led to great insight. Uh, it actually really helped me visually seeing what's going on inside the application level, the way it accesses memory. So now, uh, now that I'm at IMDEA, I'm now making more of these pictures, of these images. And I think this is a new kind of art. <laughs> I can sell those and <laughs> make money. Uh, but as you see, when the rightmost uh, image, it becomes darker and darker. It has these black spots. And if I make the workload even larger, then the image becomes completely black. And that makes sense because I'm trying to put a million data points inside a, let's say, 200 by 200 image. Like you cannot fit all this information in a small image. Uh, and then, okay, so let's zoom in. Let's zoom in until we see a line. A line may be more than one line. So when do you stop zooming into the image? So what I'm trying to say here, creating these images is not an easy task. It's not a, uh, a trivial problem. Do you create one image and then you start zooming in? Do you create many images from scratch? What kind of, how much information you put into this image? What resolution, size, color you use? And what kind of metadata? Is that image coming from the memory layer, the cache layer? What is representing? But let's say that you create these images. What can you do with those? Well, I'm gonna show you a whole new world. And this new world essentially uses computer vision methods be, uh, on top of those images uh, to build systems. And I'm gonna talk about a very specific use case, which is learning memory access patterns. So what you can create is this pipeline that collects information about memory accesses. It creates those images and that now it can use machine learning pattern recognition methods to identify patterns on the image. And then depending on the pattern, you may want to do a different thing inside your system. And what else you can do is you can do pattern prediction on top of images. You can now start learning images. But again, many challenges that come up with those. With respect to pattern recognition, to do pattern recognition on top of images, you need an image data set. We need to build the image net for memory or data access patterns. Uh, that would be very cool, but it's not easy to do. And the major challenge here is what classes do you define? What kind of patterns do we have? Uh, what, how do we label those patterns and how do we make sure the labels that we choose are, are good? And now everybody can contribute to this data set and it can be the next big thing in, uh, um, in computer systems. Uh, and then you can train classifiers, but again, what is the impact of misclassification uh, and many more challenges. With respect to pattern prediction, here's where 
where it starts becoming very cool. So now you create image after the image and now you make a video. That's exactly what a video is. So now your system can uh, watch this video and it can use machine learning algorithms that predict the next frame in a video to predict patterns, to predict images of, of those memory access patterns. But again, it's not a trivial task. Is that going to be more accurate than just using machine learning on top of raw data or just not using machine learning at all? Uh, what is the accuracy, the training times? Do we build one model for each application, for each pattern? And how do we, uh, how, how does the OS and interval, operation intervals map with the training intervals? Um, that was one problem uh, we can use, we can solve with images. I, I'm going to briefly discuss this, that we can now learn in general any type of time series data by using images. So instead of forecasting raw data, like the next number in the time series, what if you learn the image representations of those time series? And that idea came from the OSDI 2021 keynote where uh, from JP Morgan AI, AI Labs, where it seemed to work for financial type of data. So I'm just asking the question, is that going to work for any type of time series data? And of course, again, challenges as the visualization challenges I described before. So what I want you to take away from this talk is that essentially images is a way for us to reduce our input, to reduce the dimensionality. Uh, it's a way to capture in a single picture a thousand features. Uh, it has the potential to reduce input, to reduce training times. Um, and now it opens up the world to a new domain of algorithms we couldn't use before because we didn't have images. So now we can use much more algorithms. Are they gonna be more effective than what we're doing right now? I don't really know, but even just having those public image data sets, it's a fantastic contribution to the community. So essentially what I'm proposing is a new uh, intersection of research areas. We now have systems for machine learning, machine learning for systems, and I really think we should add computer vision into the vision. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I'll take questions, thank you. Tom Wendt from the University of Michigan, Google. Uh, I wonder if you've considered monetizing your memory access traces in the form of non-fungible tokens. <laughs> yeah, I should definitely think about it. <laughs> cool, anything else? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Geet Sati from Stanford University. Mm -hmm. So I think this is super interesting. It's something I've looked into before. So awesome. I was wondering, and like, so, and it's in related works from like, um, or like DNA, mm -hmm. like Google Brain stuff, done stuff yeah. where they've uh, visualized a DNA sequence and then done computer vision to predict uh, okay. sequences in it. Okay. But from the, when you talked about like the, like the resolution and zooming mm -hmm. in, I was wondering if you've done any experiments actually like on like a real memory trace, because the thing I ran into was either with sparsity or like when you have like a virtual address space, the size of the image just becomes prohibitively large exactly. to actually do predictions. So I was exactly. wondering like, what sort of experiments you've done in the past. Yes, yeah, so I've used actual memory traces as well, and that's exactly the problem. When you have a hundred thousands of pages, you cannot have a hundred thousand pixels in an image. So you start thinking about how you can create more than one image. So either you zoom in and now you create a hierarchy of images and what exactly what the link is, I don't really know. I'm exploring that. Or you can start by creating from scratch multiple images. You can say that every 10,000 memory accesses, I'm going to create a new image. But is 10,000 good? What is the number where you, how much, mem how much data do you put into a single image? So I'm working on that. I think there's worth a lot of exploration. I don't have the answer, but I think it's, it's going to be pretty cool to solve that problem. Yeah, thanks. Let's catch up more later. Any other questions? Final questions. Yeah. Okay. I think we can thank Thalia thank one more you. time. Thanks. And thanks to all the wacky speakers. Thanks to all the wacky speakers. I really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for coming. Have